and or question six from the 8182. So my plan for us in the next couple of days, I've got uh, a printout to give you today uh, that has probably, I don't know, 10 questions on it, 15, 10, 12 questions on it um, that are going to bounce back and forth between whether we use a Z distribution or T distribution um, just to get that practice at recognizing the information that's provided is going to then take us down the, the correct pathway of using the correct distribution. Um, yesterday we talked about how this one here uh, says, in a random sample of 13 microwave ovens, the mean repair cost was $85, standard deviation was 1510. Uh, using the standard, and this is what we were talking about yesterday at the end, uh, says using the standard normal distribution with the appropriate calculations for standard deviation that is known, assuming the population is normally distributed. That right there is telling us use the Z distribution. This right here, standard normal distribution, that is the Z distribution. They're the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, now, the the one thing that we are getting here is that they're saying that the standard deviation is known. When they say standard deviation um, and there's no like sample or population adjective out in front, uh, I think we should probably assume that it's an understood population standard deviation. Okay. Um, in addition, we talked yesterday that because they say 95% confidence interval using the T distribution was already established as being that, we most likely here have to use a Z distribution if we didn't gain that from the green stuff, okay? Because there's there's be no reason why they would give you all this work and ask you to find the answer when they give you the answer. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so we're going to use a Z distribution. So a couple different things that um, was perplexing to some people in first period and also some um, individual questions I've had over the last couple of days is – Margin of error. Where are we finding margin of error? Okay, well, margin of error is the component in our formula that is the Z, and it, whether it be the T distribution or the Z distribution, it's really the same portion of the formula. It is, for a Z distribution, that item right there. Okay, that is your margin of error. Okay, a lot of textbooks call it E. I believe the OpenStax textbook uses EBM, which that's the that textbook is kind of a um, the dominant textbook I use for our notes and our coursework. But I use about six or seven different texts to pull. I think what are more quality notes and more kind of well-rounded notes than what an individual textbook provides. Okay. Um, so some will use this, some will call it EBM, um, some will call it just margin of error, but that is the component. Because basically, remember what's happening here is we have, uh, let's say that we have a population. Let's say this is our population, okay? Um, and we've got these little things in here, each individual data point, okay? So let's say all of those objects in there are our population, okay? If I want to find the average of them, okay, and find mu, okay, I'd add them all up and divide by how many I have, right? Okay. But if I can't access my population, my population is too big, and I can only look at maybe that sample right there, and I find X bar, which would be the sample mean. Does that make sense? This is a point estimate for that value. Okay, meaning right now it'd be our best estimation of what the actual population mean would be. Okay, but if I took another sample, let's say that we do this process a second time and we look at maybe that cluster of things, that would be another sample mean, right? The chances are, if I call this sample mean number one and sample mean number two, a sample mean number one will not be the same as sample mean number two, okay? And neither of them will be equivalent to mu. Does that make sense? They're going to be in the ballpark of one another, but 
none of my sample means are going to be, I don't want to say, I don't want to say 0% chance, but it's most likely that my sample means, my point estimates are not going to be equivalent to the population mean, okay? Point estimate is a singular data that provides an estimation of the population. But when we do a point estimate, we have no degree of accuracy, meaning that when I say my my mean is 85, I have no degree of accuracy in how good that number represents the actual population mean. Okay, meaning I don't, how confident am I in that? Okay, am I 90% confident, 95, 99? I, with a point estimate, it's impossible to determine it. Okay, um, but what a point estimate leads to is if we can find the margin of error, it allows us to grow this estimate to the right of the point estimate and to the left, and now we get an interval, and we can be more confident then that that mu falls in that interval. Okay, so a lot of your times you're, in your textbooks, your formulas will define what E is, and then they'll write that, you know, we take X bar, we subtract that E, and then we take that X bar, and we add that E. Okay, um, which... If we do substitution then, that gives us x bar minus z sub alpha over 2, sigma over root n, less than mu, less than x bar plus that stuff. So you can see it written both ways. And the only way that I can obviously use this formula is if the components that are in it are known. Well, that component is the standard deviation of the population. So I have to know that value. Okay. If I don't know that value, the only thing that we can use in its place is a sample standard deviation. And if I use a sample standard deviation in its place, then I have to put something in that place, okay? because the Z distribution will not be accurate enough for us. Okay? Um, and that's where the T distribution comes in. That's where they got this value here. All right? So in this problem, they ask you to go through this stuff. So they provide us initially with some key pieces of information. They say that N, your sample size, is 13. Okay. They tell you that your mean repair cost of those 13 ovens uh, was 85, so that's X bar. And now the standard deviation is 1510. Now, I don't like the way that they write this. Uh, if I were to take out the things that we have highlighted here, to me, the way I read that is that when it says, you know, we have 13 microwave ovens, the mean was 85, and the standard deviation was 15.1. To me, I read that without the other things that are highlighted that provide the other context, I read that as the standard deviation of the sample 13 objects was 15.10, right? Does that make sense? Not of the population. But here they're inferring the population, okay? They want us to come up with a 95% confidence interval for the population. So we've got all the things that need to go in this formula, except for we don't know that number right there yet. Okay, so we're gonna figure that out. I like to draw a picture. Of what we're looking for here, okay? We're trying to find an interval that is going to estimate the mean, okay? and that interval, once it's found, obviously it's going to be centered on the mean. So when I look at that right there, when they told me the T distribution, if I take the midpoint of that, the midpoint of that is going to be that point estimate of 85. Okay? Um, but we want to figure out how far to the right of mu and how far to the left of mu do I need to um, move on this normal curve so that underneath the density function and between that value and that value we get 95 percent of our area okay because it's a metric because that's our confidence level this area over here let's make it red that area there and that area there should be what to one another equal okay so if they're equal, they should total 5%, right? So this red area here is 0 0.05 over 2. 
And that area there is 0 0.05 over 2. Both give me 0 0.025, right? Okay, so the next thing we do, so once we have that information, now, I like the picture. Do you need the picture? No, okay? If you're a person that says, oh, I know confidence, confidence level is 95, 0.95. So that means alpha is the complement of that. Alpha over 2, then, is 0 0.025. That's then the number that I'm going to use to reference in my table. Okay? That's the area we're looking for. Now, we can do one of two things. Okay. So this area here is 0 0.025. And my suggestion is that in your table, you find that value. Because if I go to my Z table, most of your Z tables are going to be set up this way. Um, They're going to give you a image at the top just showing you what the entries in the table represent. So this shaded area is the area that each of these numbers in the table represent. Okay, so it's a cumulative left tail up to whatever z-score that you are provided with. Does that make sense? So if I look at a z-score of negative uh, 1.02, it's 15%, so if my z-score right here is like negative 1.02 right here, that means this area to the left would be 15% of the total area. Does that make sense? So it's a left tail cumulative uh, value here. So in our image that we have, we're looking for this z-score, okay, that aligns itself is the like the demarcation line for a 0 0.025 or a 2.5 percent area okay so i'm going to search for that number in my table now i know that that number is less than 50 percent so because it's left anything that is left of 50 percent is going to be a negative z-score right okay anything greater than 50 cent 50 percent would be a positive z -score. so i know i'm going to look in the negative portion of our table and, and we can show how we can use some other tools here uh, to do this, but I'm going to look for 0 0.025 as an area. So just kind of scour through here. I get 0 0.02 here, 0 0.025 right here on the dot, okay? Now, the thing about this is that you're not always going to find exactly the area that you're interested in. So we found 0 0.025 right there. So working out gives me negative 1.96, okay? And that is then the z-score, okay, that first z-score that is going to start my 95, the 95% the, the that is centralized around the mean, okay? Now, the other thing that we could do, and this is what I, if I'm going to use a, if I'm going to use technology, this is the approach you have to use. The other thing is to find this z-score right there, okay? Now, because we already know that that first z-score was one point, negative 1 1.96, and we got symmetry, this one's going to be positive 1.96, right? Does that make sense? But when we're using this to find this 1.96 on the table it is referring to it's all left tailed cumulative area so what would that area right there in purple be 0.975 so if i look up 0.975 as an area To the right of the mean, so I know I got positive z-scores. So 0.975 is right here. And then working over at the positive 1.9, and then working up, this is the 0 0.06, so 1.96. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, but that idea there is that that was cumulative from the left. So I can't just look up... Um, Like a, a lot of people, and, and this is 
based on what our technology is going to do. If I'm going to use my technology to find maybe that z-score right there, um, I can't use like directly the 95% that's providing the problem. I, I got to do a little bit of work uh, to do that. Okay, so um, we'll use some technology here in a moment to get to, to realize this in, in a different question. Uh, so now we know that that z-score is 1.96. So 1.96, sigma was 15.10, and root 13 is that denominator. Say again? There's a table in like the earlier question that tells you 1.96. Yes, yes. There's also a, uh, in my notes, there is a 90%, because uh, we use it so often, at the 1.644 value. There's 95%, uh, which is 1.96, and I believe 99.7% uh, is, I think it's 2.58 maybe. I might have to double check that one. Yeah, uh, so for some reason, uh, the textbook that I'm gathering problems off of uses 98% a lot. Uh, but in application, real application, uh, in the real world, 99.7 is used a lot, or 99% is used a lot. Um, now, here's the thing. If you don't want to use a table, that's fine because you know these numbers because we're basically saying, okay, if, if I have five questions that all use 95%, I'm not going to go question one and run through the table and get that 1.96. And then in question two, when it says 95%, do the exact same thing. I'm going to use that information that I've already seen in the first question, right? Okay, but on a test, when I say 92%, or when I say I'm going to want you to use an 87%, because I can make it any confidence level I want, right? These are the three that are most generally used, but if I want to test you on whether you know how to use the table and what the table is providing you, I can change those percentages to anything, and if you don't know how to use the table, then you're not going to be able to solve those problems. Does that make sense? And if you're going to guess, guessing is not, it's not a great choice. Okay. Um, so when we... We go ahead and calculate this information. We get this number to be 8.208. Now, I'm not sure how the question, I cut off too much of it, how it asks you to round that. Um, I'm just going to go 8.21. Here's the issue that arises. Okay, um, That was 95%. So 95% is a unique one for the table because it produces an exact 0 0.025 area or 0.975 area, and those are exact areas that are displayed in the table, right? Okay. But if I use, let's say, 90%, so 90% would be my confidence level. Alpha would be 10%. Alpha over 2 would be 5%. So I'd be looking for 0 0.05 in this table. Well, if I go through this table and I look for an area of 0 0.05, well, let's see here. It's going to fall between these two right there. At 0 0.05 on the dot does not show up in this table. Does that make sense? Okay. So 0 0.0505 is at negative 1.64 in 0 0.04947 falls at negative 1.65. We use a process called interpolation. Okay, uh, You guys have done this with, like if we write an equation of a line, and I say, okay, here are two points for creating an equation of a line. What is the y value when x is like 1,000? You've created the equation of a line. Now you take your x value of 1,000, that's just way out beyond any of the data points that we use to create our line, you plug that in, it gives you your y value, right? That's called extrapolation, because you're trying to find a value that is outside of the data that you have. Interpolation is finding information between data points that you have. Well, these are two data points that we have, two pieces of information, and we're trying to find something in between. So we're, called, we're doing interpolation. Now, I'm not going to teach you the process of interpolation. It's ultimately working with averages. Um, but 0 0.05 is somewhere in between negative 1.6 and 1.65 and 1.64. We find out if we use technology, it's like negative 
okay, is, is the best uh, estimate and not directly in between at negative uh, 1.645, um, okay. Uh, and there lies the issue in some of uh, these questions and how Math Excel is programmed. Math Excel is programmed in the back to provide some tolerance in your answers. There's a plus or minus 0 0.02 on these values, margin of error, which basically says if, if, if Mr. Fay answers as 8.21, it would actually accept me answering it as 8.22 or 8.23. Does that make sense? Or 8.20 or 8.19. There's a uh, 200 um, margin of error, positive or minus, okay, or plus or minus. If you use like 1.64 instead of 1.644 as your z-score, that, that could throw things off a little bit. Does that make sense? So if you at any time, you type in a number here, and you type it in and it, you've exhausted your exercises or whatever, or test or quiz, you type it in and you're off by hundreds, okay? And even if you're just off by like a tenth, okay? Let me know, and I can, I can go in and look at things and make sure that I can give you points for that. Does that make sense? I don't want you to do all this work, and because of you choosing an imprecise Z-score, or not the most precise Z-score possible, that it throws off this tolerance and you get marked wrong. Okay? And this is correct. Okay. Um, so those are things that I can go back and I'm not going to make you redo the problem you did and it got it fixed for you. But if that's something that you know is, is happening, let me know and I'll go back in and um, correct those for you. The workaround for that is not to use the information from the table, but use the, um, the Z scores from a piece of software, uh, which I'll show you how to do that. But the 8.21, okay, that is our margin of error. So we're going to add that or subtract that to the mean. And we're going to get, so 85 plus 8.21 will give me 93.21. And if I subtract it, so 85 minus 8.21, I get my lower end, which is 76.79. And that's my con that's my 95% confidence interval, which means that if I were to ultimately take whatever the population is, and I were to take sample after sample after sample of 13 microwaves, 95% of the time, the mean that we're seeing in this sample was 85, 95% of the time, the mean is going to be between those two numbers, 76.79 and 93.21. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, or if somebody says, hey, I just took a sample of 13 microwave ovens. Do you want to make a bet on what the average was of their price? I'd make that bet. If, if, I, can, if I can choose a number between here, I'm going to make that bet because 95% of the time, I'm going to win that bet. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so then they ask you if that's what we have for the Z score. So let's put this on a number line real quick. If that's our Z score, our interval based off of a z-score, so it's a z distribution. Um, if I look at, you know, 76.79 on a number line to 93.21, and then look at the t distribution, and the information they gave me of the t distribution, 75.9. So 75.9 is to the left of 76.79, right? And then the upper bound in the T distribution is 94.1. Okay. And they ask you, compare these two things. And the comparison is that using the Z distribution, our interval is narrower, right? And when we have a narrow interval, narrower interval, that's actually a better thing statistically. Okay. Um, because we want to be able to you know, if I say I'm 95% confident that 
confident that the the price of a microwave is between zero dollars and two million dollars. That's pretty obvious, right? That's going to be. I'm, I, I probably say I'm 100% accurate with that. Okay, or 100% confident. But if we can narrow that gap, we can now have a better. Um, we can use that data better to make decisions. Okay. Um, however, even though this T distribution gap is bigger, or this interval is bigger, is it much bigger? No. So we're saying that mu, the actual population, if we had access to the actual population, went through and took the population average, we're saying that 95% of the time, we're 95% we're, we're confident that it's going to be in that green area. Okay. Using the T distribution, we're saying we're 95% confident it's going to be in that. They're not that different. And because they're not that different, this is making the argument that when you can't use the Z distribution because you don't have enough objects or you don't know the population standard deviation, the T distribution is going to be acceptable. It's going to give you a pretty good estimate of that interval. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that being said, I could have a mean that my population mean could be out here. It couldn't. Because I'm only 95% confident, right? So that means it could maybe rest outside. Okay. Um, but like I said, if I'm a betting person, I'm going to bet on this every single time. 95% is much more likely to happen than 5%. Okay. Does that make sense on how to do that? Okay. Now, like I said, there may be some issues with the tolerance built in, depending on rounding. Uh, depending on how you chose your Z-score, whether you use a table or technology. There is also, and, and I don't know how, how much you guys have talked about this in other classes. Um, you probably saw it maybe in like elementary, middle school. Uh, but if we have a rounding rule that says, I'm going to write, this is something that somebody had in a specific question today. Um, and I'd have to, I, to be honest, I have to research what the rounding rule actually says. So that I'm not saying something wrong, but I'm not going to make you use this. Um, because when we get to five, five is kind of the, the marker for whether we round up or down, right? It's the cut line, okay? Um, and you guys have been taught, ah, let's just cut at five. If it's five or higher, you always round up, right? But what that does is it unproportionally makes us round higher or lower overall, okay? If I was to infinitely go through all the times that things have rounded, that people have rounded numbers, we round higher more than we round lower. Does that make sense? Okay. So in order to equate that, okay, to make them equal, there is a rule that says if I want to round this number based off of that one, if it's a five, I then look at this number here, and I, this is where I have to look up what the actual rule is. But if that's a five, I look at this number, and if this number is even or odd, that's going to tell me how to round it, either up or down. Okay, or leave it, basically leave it alone or round it up. Okay, um, so I think we leave it at like 82.9 was the, the, the person's um, question. So odd, we leave it alone. Okay, round down essentially. Okay, if it's even or zero, round up. So 90.1. So this person was saying, Mr. Fett, I rounded this up to like 83.0 and 90.1 or something like that. And they say, well, they rounded this one up, but they weren't rounding that one up. They rounded that one down. Why was that the case? It's because that question, the way it's coded in Math Excel, it's using that rule. That makes sense? That might be a rule. Do you guys ever talk about that in Six Figs? Okay, so, so all that stuff is, like Six Figs is ultimately... <laughs> They're, 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 they're essentially, if you think about the rounding rules, okay, uh, so that you can replicate uh, a measurement and calculations equivalently to how I replicate a calculation and a measurement, okay? Um, so we're all on the same page with, with that kind of stuff. But I'm, like I said, I'm not going to make you do, but that's the reason why people get confused. I'm doing everything right. I'm rounding it right, or at least the way I've been taught, but it's, it's not counting it. Why? If that happens to you, let me know. I'll go back and give you the points for it. And okay. And, and that's that's just know that. And you, I think you guys know me from experience that I'm flexible with that kind of stuff. So, let, but I, you got to bring my attention to it, or I don't know. 
Um, we cool with that? Uh, let's go back to, so when, when I said 90%, and that gave that number 1.64 or 1.65, we said we had to kind of extrapolate that for 90%. If you use your um, calculator, okay, and I'll, I'll show you a couple different here. Uh, we'll use Excel here first. Um, basically what happens if I want to use 90%, You've got two options, and this is, this is, again, why I like my picture. Okay, if mu is here and I want to find this central 90%, what is going to be that area right there? It's going to be 0 0.05, right? Okay, so on my calculator, and this, this is what I would do if I'm using Excel, is that I would type in equals... Um, and I always forget if it's norm inverse, yeah, norm dot inverse or, or INV. And you can actually, it knows what you're doing if you just type in norm INV. Um, I always forget if it's INV norm or norm INV. But then once you do that, it says probability. Well, it wants this cumulative to the left probability. So I'm going to type in 0 0.05. Okay, so a lot of people won't type in 90 because that's what the, what's in the problem, right? Okay, but we have to understand that the, the calculator is programmed to, to talk about the probability, the cumulative left tail probability. Uh, and this says mean and standard deviation. Well, this is a normal curve. So our mean is zero and our standard deviation is one. Those are always going to be the two values that we want to use. And you see there that it gives a better value for the Z, right? Okay. Um, if we use that, uh, so let's say that, just interested here, if I go equals, so our error was, um, it would have been A1 times uh, 15.1 divided by the square root of 13. A1 times, there we go. So here, if I would have used a 90% confidence interval, we see our margin of error would be that. Let's go back and say, I didn't want to use 90. Let's go uh, 95 to see how different these answers are. How different is that answer compared to what we did on using, um, and, and you see here that even that table, even that table is rounded. Does that make sense? Because we saw on the table that it was exactly, it provided an area of exactly 0 0.250. That's not the case. Because at negative 1.9599639.85, that's when you get, but but for the things that we're doing, it's, it's, it's not huge that we're that level precision all the way out to like four or five, six decimal places isn't a big deal. Um, does that kind of make sense? If... So I said 5%, okay? If I want to get that positive 1.644 number, then this would have to be, okay? Again, we want cumulative. So if I want the central 90, cumulative would be that first tail of 5%, and then the 90, so 0 0.95, would give me the same 1.644 number. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, I like that. If you go to your TIA-3 or A4, um, if you go to, you see where it says VARS, it's your VARS key, variable key, hit second, and then that takes you to the distribution uh, table. The distribution table, then you can scroll down to option three, and you can see inverse norm, and then you have option four, eventually it will be inverse uh, T. Option three. So it's going to ask you this, and this is the same thing. The area, so not all your calculators will do this, depending on the age of your calculator, but the area, we want to be cumulative to the left. We want a left tail. So I'm going to type in for 95%, uh, or sorry, let's go back to 90% confidence. 90% confidence, uh, my left tail would be 0 0.05. I'm going to leave these two things the same because it's a normal distribution, so I'm just going to leave them as 0 and 1, and I'm going to paste it. 
Okay. Now, if you've got an old calculator, it never takes you to that table. It never takes you to that um, interface where you type in what you want your area to be and what you want your mu and mean to be, or your mu and your standard deviation to be. Um, it just types in inverse norm, opens a parenthesis, and then you got to type in these three things. So those three things you go in the version of cumulative area, comma, mu, comma, sigma. And now if I hit enter, it gives me that number that Excel was giving, right? Which that might be easier to use in your table, but what you got to remember is that if I want 95% or 90% or 99% or 98%, whatever it's giving me in the problem, that is not the area you type in to the inverse function, right? You type in the cumulative from the left. Uh, that is attached to those percentages. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, this idea here, this is what I was talking about yesterday. We're saying like if I, and I'm trying, I think I'm going to try to do this and see if we can actually have a, a real life scenario. I'm, I think tomorrow I'm going to have all my classes go in and just in an Excel sheet or a Google sheet and put their age in days. So I have a pot, and I'll say the population of my courses. Does that make sense? So it's, it's like 130 students. Uh, we will be able to run through and figure out, okay, this is the population mean. This is mu. This is the true mu because we have the entire population, right? We shall be able to find the true standard deviation, the population standard deviation. We'll have that data, okay? And then we'll say, okay, well, let's say that we don't necessarily know that, okay? If we have it at the side. We know it to be true. Let's say that we don't have it, but let's say we take um, – We'll, we'll take all that data and we'll use a random number generator and we'll pull out a sample of 20, 20 ages and say, okay, let's run through a T distribution with those 20 ages and see how accurate that data models what we know should really be happening. Does that make sense? And hopefully we see that in that data, it does with, with a sample of 20, does model the true population mean um, that we would norm, we would have. Okay. Some people ask, you know, and, and we talked about this with questions like this. Like, if I don't know the true population mean, I probably don't know the true standard deviation of the population. Okay. Uh, because in finding the population standard deviation, the formula needs the population mean, right? Okay. So, with, without one, you don't have the other. However, there are questions that Obviously, we're taking that we do know the standard deviation of the population, and that comes from previous studies usually, okay? Uh, if I'm going to replicate a study, I'm going to probably use other research to help me do mine. Does that make sense? So they might have, uh, in a previous study, a knowledge that, hey, these IQ scores have a standard population uh, or a, a population standard deviation of three. So then I can use that in mine as the population standard deviation, even though I don't know the population mean. Does that make sense? Um, and we'll get into a little bit of that with some of the questions that I give you uh, in the next couple of days. Hopefully that makes sense. Um,